cosplay students see? Oh my gosh. I don't even know what number this is now. Welcome. Well, maybe just start with welcome. We'll start with welcome. Welcome. Welcome to Cosplay Stitch and Same. I'm Panin. And I am Mercedes, aka V Fire, but I'll probably be just called Mercedes throughout this whole thing. I hope no one gets really confused by that. That that's okay. I just realized on our earlier ones we didn't really like introduce ourselves or forgot to. Oh, often. Oh, oh some of them just uh, just Yeah. You don't care who we are, you just want us to talk about cosplay. Let's go to cosplay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. cosplay. <laughs> Well, before we do that... Oh, yes. So, if you want to email your cosplay horror stories or... We want fun, them. Fun things like that, you can email us Cosplay at... Cosplay tragedies. Your tragedies. <laughs> uh, you know you want to share them on the internet. Um, <laughs> Misery loves company. Oh, sure does. <laughs> uh, you can email us at cosplaystitchandseam at gmail.com. Yeah. Or you can check out uh, our website, uh, cosplaystitchandseam.com. Yep, and there's a form, form that you can fill out. Form spring? No? Or is it just it's a just online a, form? It's just a blogger form. Oh, okay. I'm lazy. Oh. It works. Oh. I mean... <laughs> oh. Actually? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Our topic for today. Oh, you want me to go? <laughs> so, <laughs> We're really so professional. you know, cosplay has to start somewhere, and... As I turn into an old fogey, I realize not everyone knows, like, where cosplay came from and how it kind of became the phenomenon it is today. So we thought we would talk about broadly where it came from. And then locally here, because we live in Utah, we would talk about some of the local history. So. History of cosplay. Did you want to go first? I think my papers are mixed up, but Since hey, let's you got, go. You got the broad strokes on this yes. one. Yes, so I'm going to cover the history of cosplay uh, as in, like, in a general sense, where it started, where it came from, how it all happened. Tell me a tale. Tell you a tale. Starting in... Uh, I can't even be dramatic. <laughs> you need a dramatic voice. Dramatic voice. Dramatic voice. No, I'm just kidding. I can't. I'm not going to do it. Um, Deep in the depths of 1939. No? Hannon's much better at this. All right, deep, Aww. deep in the depths of 1939. <laughs> I thought just steal your line. Um, sci-fi conventions were a thing, and uh, a lot of people really liked going to them, talking sci-fi. I mean, sci-fi, pop culture, and all that stuff. That was a really big thing. Well, it still is a really big thing. I mean, we all love that kind of stuff. Um, but in 1939, we had our very first uh, futuristic costume. Um, no one could see me do the air quotes there. <laughs> no, no, you are audio um, only. Audio only. Uh, no, Forrest J. Ackerman uh, wore the, let's see if I can say this, futuristy costume. That's all one word. Futuristy? Futuristy costume, yes. Uh, designed by Myrtle Douglas. Uh, so Myrtle designed the costume. He wore it. They both spoke in like a made up language uh, to each other for it. And it's just like, had so much fun at the curious, first ever like... World Science Fiction Convention. What fandoms even existed at that time? I don't know. Oh. <laughs> it doesn't you say. think I re researched more than I did. No. <laughs> uh, no, it does not say, actually. All right. All right. Um, I mean, 1939, almost in the 1940s there. Mm -hmm. You've got, what, Star Trek? Uh, I don't think Star Trek was a thing yet. Oh, I was like, I don't think so that either. Was, that was later. That was like the yeah. maybe late, yeah, 60s. Flash Gordon. Oh, yeah. There Flash we go. Flash Gordon. Flash Gordon. War of the Worlds, maybe. War was, of the Worlds. It was a radio thing in, the, I, I want to say, the 30s or 40s. But, yeah, let me pretend. I'm just going to talk out my butt about things I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that's what we do Where's all the time, Wikipedia? right? <laughs> anyways. Continue. Anyways, yeah, so that was the, the first uh, fan going to a convention at the first, well, science fiction convention, the World Science Fiction Convention. Uh, World Con is actually what it's called. Hmm. Um, and he was the first fan to show up in costume for it. And again, designed by Myrtle Douglas. Can't, can't, can't give, you know, her any less credit because, like, she, she designed she and, it. yeah, built it for him. And he obviously owned it and, like, sold it so well that he's now in the history books on this. Uh, both of them are. Um, I was like, that's, that's pretty awesome. It's um, a pretty cool partnership. Yeah. Anyways, a year later, uh, in <laughs> Chicago, uh, the first World Con masquerade was held. So, uh, so the very next year, like, oh yeah, let's have a masquerade. Let's have, actually have people come and dress up and have a have a ball. So, um, <laughs> so were they like the ones who coined the term masquerade then, or I would think did they so. Have, like, a... I didn't find anything else that said that masquerade was used elsewhere. So mm. I would think that 
they did. And it wasn't a, a contest. It was more of a just a ball. It was oh, a literal okay. masquerade ball. Okay. So that's probably where we get masquerade cosplay contests. A lot of them will call themselves masquerades. It's probably because of that. Yeah, yeah. So, like, for people new to it, if your local convention, some, it's kind of a term that has gone out of date nowadays, but it yeah. used to be that masquerade was a cosplay contest, which got kind of confusing since some would have a masquerade ball, and then they'd also have a masquerade contest. Yeah. But, but yeah, back in the day, that used to just be, oh, it was just the masquerade. Yeah, and and at this masquerade, the the one in 1940, they had, you know, dancing, drinking, mm-hmm. uh, the a band, as well as prizes handed out at the end of the night. So, it was very much a masquerade ball along with being the masquerade contest. So, that makes me curious if cosplay was a thing before this convention. Like this is the first cosplay con the cosplay at a convention, but like if these parties are having masquerade balls. Like, mar- masquerade balls existed way longer before. Mm-hmm. And, like, people could probably do characters based on, like, books and things. Yeah, I think the, uh, um, yeah, I think from looking at what I was finding and whatnot, that mm-hmm. people probably made, there are probably some people who made costumes and whatnot, oh, but definitely. it was a sci fi scene, um, the science fiction conventions, Worldcon, and all that, that really made it popular. Because cool. they're like, look at this person. Yeah. Look at the in this crazy cool costume. Look at the what the future could be. Yeah. And in fact, that was a a big thing um, in those those years. So from like the forties to the seventies, it was all uh, um, sci fi was really gaining steam. Yeah, it was like, (laughs) what could the future be? Everyone was all about that whole like, what's the future gonna be like? Uh, I'm trying to find my notes here. Part where uh, someone mentioned. Like, someone showing up in this uh, Saturn monster. Um, they were, like, wearing all this crazy stuff, looked really big and heavy. And they were a, sa- a, a monster from one of Saturn's moons, you know? It's just, like, all these crazy things. Like, what could it be? Mm-hmm. And then they would build it and then wear it at conventions and be like, look at this crazy thing that could be out in space. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, here it is. In 1941, actually. So as we go through the years. 1939, we have the first co- uh, costume, because cosplay wasn't termed yet. That mm-hmm. wasn't a thing yet. So 1939, the first costume at a sci-fi convention. 1940, we have the first masquerade uh, that was an actual dance as well as a contest at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then uh, 1941, that's where we got uh, someone named uh, Milton Rothman. Uh, He's actually a nuclear physicist. He describes a handful of costumes at a convention that he's at. It doesn't say what convention it was. Probably, I would guess, Worldcon again. Yeah, yeah. Because that was the thing to be at. It was the place to be. The place to be. He says, saw a man who came as dressed as a bug-eyed monster from one of Saturn's moons. Completely handmade. Blue and yellow suit with a helmet made of dozens of feathers. Pasted on one by one. Horribly hot to wear. <laughs> that's, oh, okay. the, that's the full quote right there. <laughs> that's the life of a cosplayer, though. <laughs> that is the life of a cosplayer. Just like, how miserable can I make myself but look awesome? Mm. Anyways, we come to 1956. We're going to kind of jump a few years here. And there's more people wearing costumes. Monsters. Mutants. Uh, scientists, spacemen, aliens, assorted things uh, are now just all over this the the masquerade, and that's actually where uh, Olga Lay comes into uh, into the picture. Uh, so Olga Lay, she was the wife of the writer Willie Lay, and uh, she made a costume that uh, made Ackerman say that's just she's one of the first great costumers. She's the most beautiful. She won the most beautiful costume at the event. And so she's kind of referred to as the first great costumer in this in this hobby. Hmm. And there's actually like a couple. Well, there's a photo that I found um, of her and her daughter dressed up in a just some very gorgeous looking costumes that I'll put on the blog. Cool. Yeah, I definitely yeah. want to see those. Yeah. So as we go through 1963, you get uh, more creative things coming out. We have. Oh gosh, hang on. I gotta. This is a really weird sentence. Hang on. <laughs> I mean, we're totally not reading from papers at all. This no. is all from right off the dome. I mean, right, right off the dome, <laughs> I memorized all this. I did not. <laughs> You're so good, Mercedes. So by the time 19- 1963 comes around, more people are spending more time on their costumes. Uh, weeks, months. This is like actually being recorded that people are actually preparing their costumes for Worldcon. They're getting ready to get out there and be like, check this out. Uh, and they want to start kind of one-upping each other on... on Look at how great I put this together. I spent this much time on it. I really try to make it, uh, you know, try to create this feel or that feel. Like, you get this recorded in, like, people's comments 
um, around 1963 about like what Worldcon is like. Someone named Bruce Peltz. Do you think that? Uh, do you think that it got more? I guess crazy with the costumes because they started having it as a competition. I don't know because the competition was introduced very early on because uh-huh. they had that first year where they just had Worldcon, and uh-huh. then the second year they introduced the the masquerade and had that little bit of a contest side to it. Uh huh. I think that probably did help. I mean, people like to be competitive. We like to try and be like, "Oh, you did that thing. I well, maybe I'm I can try and do it better." But harder. Yeah, I mean, like pe- humans are competitive in nature, you know. <laughs> We like to try and see, okay, well, if he can do it, I can do it too, right? I want that on a shirt. I'm going to do that thing, but harder. I'm going to do that thing, but harder. Yes. Plus <laughs> um, do everything. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that really did help with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know that the Costumers Guild uh, was around at this time. I actually didn't look up when they started, started, but yeah. like the Costumers Guild is around at this time and people are very much like, well, if movies can make movie quality costumes, can't I? Uh-huh. Um, and you get more quality costumes that start coming out around nice. I mean like they were really quality at the beginning but you get more and more right, people right. getting into it uh-huh. there was a one thing on here that described a you had it, it drew in people who wanted to make the big movie budget kind of things where they spent a ton of money on their costumes all the way down to those who did it with as little as what what little things they could grab a hold of mm-hmm yeah, so 1963, you had Bruce Peltz um, in an Edgar Rice Burroughs inspired outfit, and uh, the the picture is is really cool looking because he's like wearing leather, he's got leather belts, he's got a bow and arrow, uh, not not something that would probably be allowed at conventions these days, you know, uh-huh. a functioning bow and arrow. Uh-huh. But <laughs> you know, back on our like first cosplay episode, one of the ones I talked about was that selfie I made. I don't know if you noticed, but the nunchucks I had in it were real like metal. Yeah, you mentioned that on the post. And I'm yeah. like, how did they let me into the con? Oh, it, because it was like 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. That yeah, the rules, rules on props have definitely changed, like, what you can take. Yeah. Uh, the 70s really liked um, nude costumes. <laughs> oh. I, mean, I was seeing as, like, a couple of the things when I was researching you know, this that popped up a few times. I figured we should mention it, too. Nude costuming was a thing. Uh, wh- there are rules against that I now. Do- I think Usually respectfully one of the first so. Usually, I see in a costume contest is naked is not a costume. Yep. Because. Because. Because, well, I mean, you don't want to. That. Yeah. <laughs> oh, go ahead. I'm, I'm good. Start, start, tell me about, tell me all about the nude costumes, Mercedes. Oh, uh, well, there's not much to say. They were nude. <laughs> there is not much there's there. Not there's not a ton of craftsmanship. To talk about. No, there's not a ton of craftsmanship that goes into that. Um, and it got banned pretty quickly. So, oh, I'm, I'm I mean, shocked, I mean, it was honestly. through the '70s that they did that. But no, they decided, yeah, no costume is well, <laughs> no costume can't enter that uh-huh. into con- conventions anymore. Thank, thank uh-huh. goodness, we don't uh-huh. need, we don't need that. <laughs> Uh, 1970, we had our um, first San Diego Comic Con in the U.S. Grand Hotel in San Diego. Did you know 300 people attended? Huh. There was not a huge thing in, with costumes at that one. In fact, I don't think hardly anybody, like, costuming was not a huge draw to it. Because, again, it was, it was a Comic Con. Yeah, you were yeah. there for the comics. So um, we beat them in our first year at Anime Bonsai. We had 600 <laughs> people. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, then. <laughs> um, come its fourth year, though, uh, San Diego Comic-Con started doing its uh, own masquerade. So 1974, it did its own masquerade. Okay. Um, and uh, had the voice of Rocky the Squirrel and Natasha... Fatal? <laughs> Fatal. 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 Thank you. You know, Boris and Natasha that were in Rocky and Bullwinkle. There you go. Yeah. Yep. I'm old. I wasn't even born when these cartoons were up, but I know them. <laughs> uh, 1975, you've got Germany describing sci-fi conventions as largely devoted to costumes, dances, parties, and mutual flattery. <laughs> and mutual flattery. I like that part. I mean, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, I, I don't want to attend a con without a good deal of mutual flattery. <laughs> That's just, I mean, why else would you go? The mutual flattery event is my favorite part. So at this point, costuming in the U.S. is a big thing. It's already, well, not like a huge, huge thing, but in the subcultures of sci-fi and whatnot, you have a lot of people that are making costumes, and it's it's really starting to build up. Now, in 1980, cosplay starts taking off in Japan with the release of Mobile Suit Gundam, and I'm going to have Panin pronounce this. Oh, Urusai Yatsura? 
Yes, those Which series. Which is one of the first ones by uh, Rumiko Takahashi, if you like Inuyasha. That was one of her first works. Yes, and those are what helped uh, cosplay start taking off in Japan uh, in 1980. Did I say Urusai? It's Urusei. Urusei Yatsura. Sorry. I chose you because Ayo! you could say it. I ain't, no! <laughs> no! Those are very different words. Anyways. <laughs> Anyway, so, yeah, so a, a lot of people associate cosplay with Japan, um, but it started uh, picking up much later um, in Japan than it did in the U.S., but it, it took off pretty big over there. Yeah. Um, they, they saw that, they were like, oh, this is cool, let's do more, let's make it bigger. Do that um, thing, but harder. Yeah, do that thing, but harder. Uh, 1982, <laughs> Worldcon actually does, they they start making the cosplay, or the masquerade contest, um, uh, they actually gave it three categories at this point. Oh. Uh, that's so. 1982, 1982 is when you get novice, journeyman, and master, or beginner, intermediate, and master. There's a lot of different ways to say that, but you got your three levels of craftsmanship finally introduced into the the competition mm-hmm. um, crowd, okay. uh, which I think was really helpful because I mean, when you start getting more and more people, well, <laughs> you don't want beginners competing against masters. Mm-hmm. That's really intimidating. So. Uh, 1983, you get Costume Con uh, for its first first time uh, being run. Mm-hmm. Um, takes costuming from the sidelines and made it the main attraction for for a convention. So Costume Con is all about costumes, mm-hmm. and it still is to this mm-hmm. day. It mm-hmm. still is very focused on all that uh, craftsmanship. They have four or five different cosplay co- costume contests just at that con. Yes, yeah, they are. They break it down into like original designs and anime and sci-fi fantasy, like. Yeah, if you're a crafter and you really want to push your skills, that's the convention to go compete at. Because mm-hmm. you'll get your your butt handed to you. Oh. <laughs> I just look at the the photos and things from it and I'm just like, that's oh, cool. it's so cool. So that's pretty. pretty cool. So so much amazing talent that goes there. And then in 1984, we finally get the term cosplay coined. Um, it was actually by the Japanese reporter and manga publisher. I'm going to have you say the name again. Oh, no. Takahashi Nobuyuki. Okay, I can say Takahashi. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, he's the one who coined the term. He went and attended Worldcon, actually. He went to Worldcon in Los Angeles, saw all these costumes around, and put costume and play together as a wordplay, cosplay, costume play, to as a way to help encourage Jap- like his Japanese readers. Like a Hollywood couple. Like a Hollywood couple, yes. Yeah. But it's costume and playing, and it's like, oh, look, they go great together. Instead of, like, Brangelina. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And yeah, he gave he he wanted his readers to kind of grab onto that and do more with it, and that did, did help. Uh, so now we know, nice. uh, especially with uh, anime and manga and j- Japanese video games and things like that, we call it cosplay. So cosplay and costuming, they have a lot of overlap, and they're essentially the same thing. Um, mm. Just have very different kind of backgrounds because you have the costuming within okay. the U.S. and then you got cosplay, which is coined here and inspired by what happened in the u.s um Mm -hmm. but it's huge in japan like so big well and it's really interesting too how different countries i guess how they celebrate cosplay and what cosplay means to them but just like um like when we went to japan for world cosplay summit the way they do a lot of cosplay there is it just has a very different feeling like you can cosplay only in designated areas and you know you can only like be in cosplay from this time to this time you have to use specific changing rooms whereas here like you see cosplayers roaming the halls people like will just stop in the middle of whatever they're doing and take pictures and like i don't know it's a very different vibe too yeah it's it's very very fun (laughs) it's fun yeah i mean they're both both fun in different ways but Mm -hmm. Yeah, so now we're coming up to uh, the 90s. Um, there's more popular uh, anime TV sh- series like Sailor Moon. Yeah! Um, uh, Sa- well, Sailor Moon aired for the last... The original Sailor Moon anyways aired for the last time in 1997 in Japan, um, but it inspired, uh, according to the Japan Times, a gazillion cosplayers. <laughs> a, a gazillion. A literal gazillion. Uh, that's what it says. A gazillion cosplayers to don Japanese schoolgirl miniskirts, prudence yep. be damned. <laughs> yep. I mean, but come on. I mean, Sailor Moon's awesome. <laughs> I mean, I don't count this as my first cosplay, but my first cosplay was Sailor Moon <laughs> in like 19, I want to say 97, 98 maybe. 
No, it was actually earlier than that because I was in middle school. Aww. Wow, I'm old. It's <laughs> so maybe like 96. That's so cute. It's so cute. In 99, the first cosplay cafe um, to open an a- Akihabara. Thank you. <laughs> Tokyo. Um, uh, so they had a cosplay cafe open up and there's a ton of them that are now in all over Japan. Oh um, my gosh, they're so fun though. They look like, like fun. If you want to go somewhere and nerd out hard about your fandom... You go to a cosplay cafe, <laughs> you eat Love Live food, and you get waited on by Love Live cosplayers, and you buy the Love Live merchandise, and like, or Gundam. I mean, go to the Gundam cafe, and you go take a picture with the actual life-size Gundam, and you go buy Gundam pancakes, and you... I mean, it's fun. They Gundam know how pancakes. to merchandise their fandoms. I want Gundam pancakes. That sounds awesome. Oh, Gundam pancakes are awesome. They better be... Are they giant? No, they have, like, a little Gundam stamped into them. Aww, cute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, or, like, there's the Square Enix well, I want Gundam Artmia size Cafe, pancake. and it pancakes. looks like a giant bean. And you go in, and there's... That's pretty great. It is! It's so good! <laughs> when we went, they had all the, the artwork from The World Ends With You, like, displayed, and you can go buy your favorite plushies, and you can order, like, a cloud sundae, and an Aerith one that comes with a little pink bow on top. Aww. And, um, so to wrap up the last couple of years, from 2000 to now, cosplay has, like, it's been gaining in popularity. Costuming has been gaining in po- popularity, but it just has exploded over the past, mm-hmm. like, decade oh, and a half. Like, it just, boom. Cause, it's like, been so weird, because, like, like, I got into cosplay right, like, I mean, I did when I was in the 90s for, like, Halloween and stuff. But, yeah. like, I actually started cosplay, like, right there at the, like, turn of the millennium. And just seeing, like, what was available then and what resources you had for cosplay then, how weird of looks you got for cosplay then, and seeing what it's like now. Like, people actually know what the word cosplay is. You don't have to you know, explain, so explain it. it. People <laughs> actually know because there's been cosplay TV shows and there's been... And a lot of reasons for that. Uh, World Cosplay Summit was a big one to help kind of push that forward. World Cosplay Summit started in 2003 with mm-hmm. about... Four countries? Started with four countries competing against each other. Now there's over 30. Now tell me, Mercedes, what is World Cosplay Summit? Oh my gosh. Well, why are you asking me? I should be asking you. (laughs) Because I was trying to be funny. Funny. (laughs) I know. I've Uh, never heard of it. Tell me about this World Cosplay Summit. Well, there's a person I know. Her name's Pannon. Oh, who's that? And, I mean, she competed in it with Garnet Runestar uh, in... What? That sounds Was it 2014? Yes. Okay. (laughs) It's like, I need to keep my notes better. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. No, no, World Cosplay Summit is awesome. It's different countries put together really well-made costumes, really well put together skits, because it's not just the costume about it, it's also the play part. So the whole performance and craftsmanship just kind of combines all into one of this big, crazy show of amazing pr- cosplay proportions. Nice. Um, it's so, so cool. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, they have over 30 countries that compete in that now. Mm-hmm. And then also in 2013, I know within the cosplay community, some people find this as like, oh no, that was, that was, that was really weird. That, why, why did that happen? Um, but at the same time, like it helped really put the cosplay name, like the word out there of what cosplay is as it entered TV and whatnot, mm-hmm. uh, very heavily with heroes of cosplay. Yeah, yeah. And that I think really created a huge boost for like, what is cosplay? What can we, you know, how can I get into it? Um, I mean, it did make it seem a little bit more dramatic than it sometimes gets, yeah. but at the same time, it showed how much these people love I their mean, craft. Right. Like, say what you will about the show or about the people in it, but like, look at now what has come because of it. You go to Joanne Fabrics and you can buy like textured pattern things in exactly what you need. There are patterns like actual McCall's simplicity, whatever patterns of like Pokemon and Black Butler. You can get one for and Princess Zelda. A TARDIS and Princess Zelda. And like as a beginner cosplayer, there that would never have like been in my wildest imaginings that that would be so mainstream. Yeah, I I, I started like right as a lot of this like changing started coming into play. So I you know first went from making my own custom printed fabric to go, <laughs> going to the store going, oh, they have that now? They have it already. And it's cheaper than custom printing. Dang it. Yeah. 
It's really nice. It's super nice. Like, right now, cosplay is fantastic. You can usually find, like, if you want to go and compete in a contest, you can find a convention nearby, go compete. Don't want to compete? You can usually find a ton of people who want to go and play, you know, just cosplay with each other. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's cosplay picnics to cosplay conventions to... Um. We're even getting cosplay studios, like yeah. In uh, there's a couple in California. There's a makerspace here yeah, that's yeah. dedicated just to cosplay. The mm-hmm. the Anarchy Girls cosplay here mm-hmm. in Salt Lake. They're like the leather shops here teach classes weekly, monthly yep. that feature different ways to cosplay. It's like it's, a, it's so weird to me. I mean, it's awesome, it's, but it's so yeah, it's crazy so to me. different from how much that has changed just in the past ten years. Mm-hmm. And it's wonderful because more people can get into it. It's more beginner friendly. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not this like oh, you need to know all these things in order to do it. No, it's like here, come learn it, come try it. And it always has been that way, but now there's more people getting into it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, so that's what I've got on like the general history of cosplay history what you... of cosplay history of cosplay there's my dramatic voice um <laughs> anyways you should do <laughs> the history of utah uh the cosplay of utah cosplay so i guess it's hard to talk about the history of utah cosplay without talking a little bit about what just the culture in general here is kind of like like utah is it has i feel like there are a lot more like things to do like if you're going out on a date friday night like you don't just dinner and a movie there are like mini golf things there are trampoline emporiums you know there are all kinds of crazy things you can do there are like gaming nights here and there and everywhere i think a lot of it has to do with like the local culture and uh religious affiliations but I think that's also why you look at Utah and it's almost every year is dubbed like the nerdiest state in the U.S. because we consume so much nerdy stuff. And I just consume it. I eat it for breakfast. Like, (laughs) like, I mean, we're one of the driest states in the U.S. and people aren't going to... I mean, people are still going to bars and stuff on a Friday night and dance clubs and whatnot, but people are going to do so many other different things on a Friday night because they want to get into all these different nerdy things and fun activities and basically just celebrate their fandom. If you want to break a drinking habit, become a nerd. (laughs) I mean... I'm I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm totally kidding. If you've ever seen, like, the Drunken Moogle, they have, like, nerdy-themed drinks of all your favorite video games. The, um... Watchtower Cafe here in Salt oh, Lake yeah, has yeah, yeah. nerdy themed drinks. It's a little coffee shop. Yeah. Shout out to the Watchtower because they do They're a lot amazing. of like, they let podcasts go record there. I know uh, mm-hmm. the Kawaii Cast does, Cracked Brain, I think, mm-hmm. does their recordings there. And yeah, they just have a lot of nerdy paraphernalia and like fun themed drinks and whatnots. Anyway, so talking about the history. Then for uh, cosplay in Utah, I thought I would talk a little bit about the convention scene because, like, with your history, you talked about what cons were uh, the world con and things like that. And that's where, oh my gosh, I'm so. A lot of people think cosplay is this brand new thing, but it's been around for a while, uh, especially here in Utah. Yeah, and uh, cosplay cons tend, well, cosplay cons, conventions tend to, like, be the fire before the smoke that is cosplay. You know, you have the convention and it just brings cosplayers to it in in droves. So the first that I could find for conventions in Utah uh, was Life, the Universe, and Everything, which is a uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy reference. And I don't know that cosplay was a big thing there until, It's like, still not even a big thing there. Yeah. It's still very much a writing convention, but yeah, you yeah. do get a couple of people dressed up as their favorite book characters. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I went there last year. Okay. Or this, this year. This year in February. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, there were a couple, like, maybe maybe I could count on my fingers how many people there were dressed up. Yeah. Um, when I first went was back in 2003. We went there to do a a Magical Girls panel and uh, do a panel on webcomics, because at the time I ran, like, two or three different webcomics, and uh, 
Hannon's done everything. I know, I am such a nerd. Um, but yeah, it was a pretty small convention, and us and maybe a few others were the only ones in cosplay. I mean, you could count them probably on your two hands how many cosplayers there but, were. But, like, the, all the attendees there love seeing it. Oh, um, yeah. I, I didn't see anyone, like, be really mean or anything about it. They are just like, oh, cool, I know this character. And then they would yeah. chat forever about, like, that book or something. And yeah, yeah. Um, so I I would assume that's the first place that we actively had cosplay in Utah, though I imagine it was probably pretty small and pretty mm -hmm. uh, whatnot. And that was in uh, 1976 was the first year they held wow. it. Like I said, I don't have a record on what year cosplay became a thing there. Like you said, it's still not a thing there, but... Yeah. The next one where definitely there was cosplay happening was Conduit, which was a sci-fi and fantasy convention, usually held in Salt Lake City, Utah. I missed that one. And Conduit's first year was in 1991, and it was actually the first convention that I ever attended in 2001. Hmm. No, 2000? 2001. I think I attended one before I graduated and then one after. Okay. But that was where I met people in the anime scene and also, you know, there were actually a lot of people in like Lord of the Rings cosplay, Star Trek, Star Wars. Conduit, I mean, Conduit was a very, uh, it was a, a writing convention, but it was also yes. a crafting convention. And yeah. you got up, you, you went there to not only go to the writing panels, but to also check out the cosplays yeah. and see what people had made. And it was huge on art too. Like their, uh -huh. their art gallery was really fun to, to go really and tour pretty, and all yeah. that. Yeah. Um, it was also the first cosplay contest I can remember entering, uh, way back in, in 01. Yeah. Uh, 01. I think I entered in 02. Their contest followed the Customers Guild. It did. It did yeah. ICG rules. Which I was very confused by because the first award I ever got was a chutzpah award. And I was like, I don't know what this means. <laughs> and I had to go look it up. But yeah, it was a lot of fun. And they were... It was kind of what got me excited about costuming competitively because they were so excited to see cosplayers at the con um, and see people just excited about costume. It's also where I learned about Filk, if you've ever heard about that, which is like fan uh, musical content. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd never heard about that until I was there, and I was like, what? It's really fun. They do like sing-alongs and stuff. Sing-alongs were a lot of fun. So, I don't see that anywhere else. Yeah, you yeah. really don't, outside of like the sci-fi fantasy community. Yeah. Which is which is a shame, Um but anyway, uh, moving along from Conduit, I have the one that I can talk to you for like forever about, which is Anime Bonsai, which was the first anime convention in Utah. I can tell you about that one mostly because I was the founding person. Like, I say founding person only because I was the club president at the time. Yeah. But the convention itself She's was, one of the founders. Yeah. It was founded by uh, this group of awesome ladies uh, that went by... Our group name was Femgrilla, because it was like Shangri-La, but for ladies. Cute. <laughs> um, so Femgrilla, and the the one fellow who was married to a Femgrilla, who, this is going to sound so nerdy, but his handle was Master Ninja Pichan. <laughs> <laughs> so it was basically like this, there were a lot of people volunteering that made it happen, but the six of us were kind of like the founders who planned it and divided up the workload and things like that. So since I was the club president at the time of the local anime club at Salt Lake Community College, I went and did a lot of the like con chair person stuff, like reserving the building and figuring out the budget and whatnot. But yeah, we uh, did our first year expected maybe two or 300 people tops, and we ended up with 600, which just goes to show like how many people were wanting that to be a thing in Utah at the time, like who were just excited about the idea of anime and people yeah. celebrating it. And I was like, definitely you know, by this time you have a lot of like precedences with other anime conventions around yes. the, the U S mm -hmm. as well as like comic conventions and whatnot. Definitely. And so it's like here in Utah, it's like, let's have something like that too. And uh, what I thought was really cool with anime bonsai was that the crowd, it seemed to draw, I would say half at least cosplayers. Like yes. so many people cosplay to anime bonsai. It just, hugely draws in cosplayers i think after the the, the first so the first year that i went uh -huh. um i i took a costume with me but anytime i go and i'm not wearing a costume i feel underdressed <laughs> like everybody there is yeah. dressed up it's crazy 
Um, and, you know, I'm honestly not sure why that is, because you go to different conventions around the world and around the United States, and you get a percentage of people who cosplay, but... You see cosplayers. You see, yeah. Uh, but it's not... But you don't feel underdressed. <laughs> quite as, like, an overwhelming percentage as I've seen here. Yeah. But yeah, we we started it with 600 people showing up, and it's been going since then, and still runs to this day. I don't know what else to say about it. Um, my favorite. I was the con chair for the first two, three years, and then I moved over to events and things. Um, I think a lot of it was because... How many attendees do you have now? Oh, gosh. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. It's less than 20,000. I know that. Um, because we, we're outside Salt Lake City right now. Yeah. Um, I want to say around eight to 12,000 people a year, probably. I remember the one of the first years where we hit, like, 5,000. It was yeah. so crowded. Yeah, yeah. Was I think, that at the Sheraton? I think it was at the Sheraton. Um, I don't know if we yeah. hit five, if, if it hit 5,000 that year or not, but I just remember, like, when we, we were at the Sheraton, like, the first year that I went, it was, like, open hallways, and yeah. I could still walk freely, and then, like, two years oh, later... Gosh. It was, like, traffic jams oh everywhere. Oh, my goodness! And I was like, yeah, yeah. what's gonna happen? And, like, we're gonna move to to the Davis Convention Center. And I was yeah. like, cool! And then I was like, dang it, I had to travel farther. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the things I like about Anime Bonsai is they've always tried really hard to do events that include cosplay. And yes. they are not afraid to try, like, new events. So they do, like, you know, like, scavenger hunts or cosplay chess or, like, battle cosplay. Battle or, like, cosplay is so much um... fun. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, but yeah, they, and, and Bonsai does events all throughout the year too, which is do. really fun. Uh huh. Uh huh. One of the other things I will say with Bonsai, and I don't know if this is true for all conventions, but I know it is a, a lot of them, especially recently, is um, Anime Bonsai. Is still, all the profits go into the next year. Yeah, they do, they're completely voluntary. Anything you pay into the con for, like, your admission, if you do artist style, if you do a dealer thing, it goes right back into the very next year's mm -hmm. uh, activities. So, like, people aren't being, like, rewarded for it. Like, Yeah, it's a not-for-profit kind yeah, of thing. It, which I think is really cool, and it gives a different feeling, I think, than some of the bigger conventions that are for profit. Mm -hmm. Because you know they're Fanatiku. there. Fanaticu. Fanaticu also, yeah. Yeah, Fanaticu has... A uh, I hope it comes back. Yes. I keep rooting for it. Uh, it's a very tiny convention. Um, they had a very big, expensive thing happen that yeah, made it so they, they couldn't be... They're next on my list. They're next on your list. I'll yes. let you talk about them then. <laughs> but I love Fanaticu. That, like, I say Anime Bonza is my favorite. Fanaticu is actually my favorite. Aww. <laughs> Aww. It's because how tiny it is. No, it's so fun. But yeah, I really like that feeling because you... And, and I've gotten that from other cons out of state, too. But you know that the people who are helping run it and the people who who attend you know uh, really are there because they love it and because... volunteers who love doing their job yeah 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 so i just think that's cool uh so the next convention i was going to talk about is anime fanatiku and i actually got some information from sarah hall who was one of the people who helped run it when it was still going yes um it looks like they uh, were inaugurated the same year as Anime Bonsai, actually. They were starting around 2005. Like, okay. officially, Anime Bonsai started in 05. And it looks like Fanatiku hosted in three of the county libraries in 05 to have gathering places. And before that, all of the cosplayers in that community really only had, like, Anime Vegas and things like that as the closest thing to them. So, yeah, so Fanaticu is located in southern Utah, where Anime Bonsai is located in northern Utah, and as far as, like, population as well as the population percentage that is nerds, uh -huh. uh, is definitely a lot greater in northern Utah than it is in southern Utah, but it has been growing. Yeah, yeah. To give you a, an estimate for, like, size of Utah, it's, like, from... Salt Lake to St. George is about three and a half hour drive. Yeah. So it, it's pretty far away. Utah is the same size as Germany. Is it really? Yes. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so it's quite a drive. But yeah, they, uh, um, <laughs> but yeah, they started out uh, making cosplay a pretty big thing. They hosted uh, sewing and how to workshops for cosplay. They did crafting days. Which I kind of wish we did here where like they were con sponsored crafting days. You could just show up with other people and That'd be really Go fun. To town. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and eventually they started having cosplay contests as part of their convention. 
just skimming. I'm sorry, Sarah. You sent me so much good stuff. But yeah, it says the... Fanatica usually gets about, what, 500 attendees? I I don't have numbers, actually. I'm I'm just going to paraphrase that one. I think they get about 500 attendees, so it's a very small and personable convention. Uh Uh-huh. When I first went to it, that's what I love about it so much, is that it is a tiny convention, and they... It's just, like, you can go out in the hallway and chat with people. I hosted some panels at it, and then was able to, like, continue talking with people out in the hallway because it didn't feel like, yeah. oh, this is such an important person, I can't speak with them afterwards. Uh, it was, uh-huh. oh, yeah, let's just go chat. Let's keep continuing the conversation here. And, like, uh-huh. um, we'd have I'd have, like, little powwows in the hallways, and it was so much fun. Yeah, yeah. And um, um, it looks like there also are some other, like, small mini-cons and things that are hosted locally in St. George. Yes, there's a Hur- uh, Huracan, isn't there? Huracan is one of the new ones recently, um, but they do hold some in, like, local bookstores, or comic book stores. Yeah. That have little cosplay contests in them and things so like that. So those down in St. George, there are little mini-things that you can go in there are and things. check out. Go be par- participate in them, help, help promote yeah. them. And then it looks like the next one was in 2012. We ended up with Anime Salt Lake. I know it was around that same time we got, like, Steam Fest. Yeah. Which I don't see much for, for Steam Fest anymore. Or, and I know yeah. Anime Salt Lake only ran for three years. Steam Fest um, went for a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, and then um, it, it shrunk down. And mm-hmm. I think they're trying to do, like, one-day things now. Yeah, yeah. But I haven't heard anything for a while. Yeah. And, uh, that one was so much fun. And of course, now we have a uh, Salt Lake uh, Comic Convention, Salt Lake Comic Con Fan X. Is that what it's called? S- Salt now? Lake Comic Convention fa- or Salt Lake Fan X? Fan X. Fan X is somewhere in the name of it. I can't remember exactly, but it's you know Salt Lake Comic Convention um, or Fan X Convention. Okay. That there. really helped the cosplay community just explode oh here in gosh, Utah. And that was in uh, 2014 is when they started. Yep. It's been interesting because, like, cosplay used to be something that I was only used to seeing of anime and things like yes. that. And when cos- Fanex came around, it was kind of like, you got to see all these different things. Like, yes. all these different fandoms. You got to see, you know, comic books. You were seeing pop culture. You were seeing anime, books, uh, podcasts. Yeah. All kinds of different things. So it was really cool. It was, yeah, that one just made the whole thing just explode wide open here in Utah. Like, it was already growing and whatnot, but that just, it just psh, broke the roof and everything. And that was really cool to see. Yeah. It's like, now I can go to uh, the store and I'm, like, purchasing something. And if I say, oh, yeah, it's for cosplay, I don't get weird looks anymore. It's like, oh, what are you making? Like, yeah, people are... Yeah. The general public is more excited about it, and I really, right. I really do love that. Right, right. Yeah. And from what I can tell, there are like about twenty or so conventions now ongoing in Utah, so you can find something every month or every few weeks if you really wanted to. It just depends yeah. on your fandoms and your fan base. Uh, there's also the pop culture convention. That one's a really teeny culture. one that just start started there's, a couple years ago. There's yeah, there's Nerdtacular, Crystal Mountain. Nerdtacular's Polycon, been here for a long time. Toshocon. Ten um, eleven years. There's an anthro weekend. There's mm-hmm. all kinds of stuff. So uh, I love Nerdtacular. Salt for like board games. Like what's the, there's a my dad you, was super excited because there's like a genealogy con. <laughs> <laughs> that he's so excited about. You name it, you um, can find something I mean, that you can go to. You probably don't, don't dress up a play to That would be weird. <laughs> Maybe to I, I could see conventions. I could see historical costumes. I am dressed for that. as my ancestor. Uh, yeah, okay. I, well, I wouldn't say dressed as like uh, as for characters, but more for yeah. like this is this was made in the technique that my ancestor would have used to create clothing okay, or something like okay. that. I could see that. But probably more for, like, a booth rather than an attendee doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's fair. But yeah, so yeah, there's there's your history of cosplay. Right, a brief history of cosplay locally and on a worldwide spectrum. So if you guys want to share with us your favorite moment in cosplay history, we now have a Facebook group. Uh, just look for Cosplay Stitch and Seam. Tell us about what you what you think is an iconic yeah. moment or what was groundbreaking for you in the world of cosplay's yeah, history. Wherever you're at. If you're in another state, I would love to hear what your state's kind of history of cosplay started, is. Yeah. What conventions are, are big there? What are some fun, notable things in in the, the history of cosplay growing there? Uh, or yeah. costuming in general? Yeah. 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 
come say hi. Uh, we've had some earlier episodes that you can uh, latch on to the, uh, the posts from those. Introduce yourself. Tell us about your first cosplay. Things like that. Yep. So now we're moving on to horror stories. Favorite part, horror stories. Woo! And this week we have some from you guys. So thanks for sending those in. Um, I'm going to start with uh, this one from Elise Gobbledygook is her <laughs> username on her email. So Hi, Elise. It says, uh, Hi, my name is Elise, and here is my cosplay horror story. My bestie and I had decided to go to a convention in Salt Lake City. I'd read the Cantarella manga and wasn't really cosplaying any particular character from it, but had just made a dress of a similar style as some of the ones the characters wore. This was also the first convention I had ever been to, so I didn't really have the hang of cosplaying yet. I'd had some pain as we were getting ready and just dismissed it as some minor cramping or gut issues that would go away in a few hours, so I pushed through it and went to the convention. That, that's mm. promising. <laughs> I think we lasted about two or three hours before before the pain was getting so bad that I was spending a great deal of time in the bathroom just trying to collect myself oh no. and try getting through it to have at least some fun. Note that dealing with major cramps and sweaty clamminess is awful when you're wearing a restrictive layered dress that's difficult to handle in the bathroom. Finally, it got so bad that I eventually convinced my friend that we had to leave. It wasn't until we were in the car and I started uncontrollably crying that we realized how bad the situation actually was. We got back to our dorm and she helped me change out of cosplay since I couldn't get the dress off by myself. Since I was the only one with a license and in no state to drive, honestly, it's a miracle that we didn't get into an accident while I was driving on the way back to the dorm, oh considering gosh. how bad the pain was. We flagged down someone else in the dorm to transport us to the hospital. Everything ended up being okay, but it's a weekend I will never forget. So I'll wrap it up with some words of wisdom. Don't force yourself to suffer through a convention when you're feeling cruddy and always have a buddy with you at a convention to help you out. So thanks so much, Elise, for sharing that. We're sorry you had to go through that. That was frightening. Like, it's definitely good advice. Have a buddy with you. And if you're not feeling well, like, don't just let it sit. Like, cosplay... Yeah, her advice was are, very good on yeah, that. Yeah, well, cosplay can be so uncomfortable anyway, and... Sometimes it's like a new pain you're not used to, or it pokes you in a certain, like, like don't just sit and let the pain get worse, guys. <laughs> All right, what do you got? I've got a story from Cassini Closet. <laughs> Cassini is amazing, by the way. If you haven't seen uh, her, her, uh, her work, it's all mascot cosplays and just really incredible stuff. Uh, so her story, uh, she says, I'll try to my best to keep this short. Uh, she has a Bowser mascot cosplay. This is at Anime Bonsai. Uh, she had friends who were Peach, Mario, and Daisy, and she had Aww. just come off stage from the contest, and they left her be in the hallway while they went to go watch the rest of the contest. Uh, Peach had sprained her ankle days before the con, so she needed a place to sit. Three minutes of being in the crowded hallway and having adrenaline and nervousness go away, I realized I needed to get out of the suit. I was overheated. Oof. Oh no. <laughs> that is a mascot thing. Yep. I needed assistance with the shell part when putting it on and off, and it needed to be lifted while I got out of the suit, or the shell would roll on the ground. Spotters are a must with that particular costume to keep it clean and presentable. I walked the hallways trying to find a pink dress for P Princess Peach, and finally found one, and looked up, and it was a guy dressed as Peach, oh, no. and his companion was a female Mario. Ah! It was not the princess I was looking oh, for. Oh no, your princess is in another castle. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was very confused oh. seeing this crossplay. They thought it was fantastic th uh, that I, Bowser, <laughs> bumped into them. We had pictures <laughs> taken. <laughs> and I returned to head outside to cool off. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's so adorable. I like that one. Uh. All right. Thanks for sending in your horror stories, guys. Remember, you can send those to cosplaystitchandseam at gmail.com. Or you can go to the the website, cosplaystitchandseam.com, and fill out the form on our contact page. Thank you. Yeah. Um, We'd love to hear from you. Suggestions, uh, feedback, all of that. We'd love, love, love it. Yes. 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 You can listen to the podcast on Apple Podcast, Google Play, and Stitcher. Uh, and uh, probably most places where you can listen to podcasts. Um, and uh, on the blog itself. Or wherever you get your podcasts. And we are looking for opportunities to do some more live episodes. So if you'd like Cosplay Stitch and Seam to visit your area, contact us or contact your local convention and let them know that you'd like us to come see what the cosplay scene is like in your area. That's it. 
That's it. What's your what's your quip? I don't have one. A quip is a quip that your stitches seemed. I don't. <laughs> what do you want? That's I the show. Thank you, everybody. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> do it. Do it again, but harder. What is? What do it again, but harder. <laughs> oh no, that was not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do the thing, but harder. I don't know if that's better. I'm gonna get Goodbye, another, everybody! I'm gonna get another call from my mother. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. We forgot to say. <laughs> the audio was put together by our good friend David Jeffries from Dungeons and Chill. So mad props to him for putting up with us. And mad props to the music from Macy. <laughs> Oh, good night, everybody. How did that work? I'll cut this out, but I'm like legitimately I, curious. Like, how do you do it? What are you cosplaying? Yeah, how do you costume? What do? is it? Do you I just like tone your body? Is it body paint? Uh, they well, they said it was mostly body paint and and ex- well, bikinis. Bikinis are now allowed again, but like that's what they were banning was huh. those. And uh, just, but I had to delete the photo. There was a new photo. <laughs> she was completely topless. I mean, oh, no. green women from you know wherever they are. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. I, like that's all I can think of. Uh, and they were all yeah, and all of them are women too. So you know, I mean, I bet, I bet, I bet if we looked it up, we could probably find a nude guy. Kicks out for cosplay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, I just, well, thanks. never mind. Thanks. We're done. We're, we're, <laughs> and cut. And cut. And I'm done. We're done. This is our last episode. Goodbye. We're done. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. We're going to start. We're going to start again. Are we? Nude costumes. <laughs> oh, go ahead. I'm, I'm good. Start. Start. Tell me about. Tell me all about the nude costumes, Mercedes. Because, okay. I mean, it was still, it was still kicking up in Japan, starting to get that, that steamroll, steamrolling. Is that right? That's not the right word. Steamrollery. Picking, picking, picking up steam. Picking up speed. Thank you. All right, all right. <laughs> Trying to get it to pick up steam in Japan. <laughs> picking up speed. I don't know what I'm saying anymore. Just say it. Picking up speed. I'm gonna say that. Okay. Do it. All right. So you can listen to the podcast on Apple Podcast. Apple Podcast. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> Okay, I did do that right. Okay, I did, <laughs> stop it. Okay. 